Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Is the Democratic Party's traditionally rock-solid support for Israel slowly eroding? Let's get to the bottom line. When President Joe Biden got to the White House, he had a long list of priorities that he wanted to tackle. And the Palestine-Israel issue was probably competing for last place on that list. But as it always does, that open wound of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict has a way of forcing itself onto the world's agenda. And now Biden is facing calls from within his own party to really address it. The U.S. president finally called for a ceasefire after about 10 Israelis and 200 Palestinians were killed, including scores of women and children. But the administration has mostly emphasized strong support for Israel and issued some mild statements expressing concern about the loss of life on both sides. The Biden White House has also blocked the U.N. Security Council resolution criticizing Israel for the hostilities three separate times. There's been harsh criticism of Israel, not only by progressive members of Congress and even centrists like Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Senator Bob Menendez are now demanding that Biden do more. Some Americans see a change in the dynamic of the Palestine-Israel issue in the United States. But are things really changing? Today, we speak to University of Michigan history professor Juan Cole, whose influential blog on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East turns 20 years old next year. It's called Informed Comment, and it's a must-read blog on this crisis. Professor Cole, before we begin, I had a chance to ask Senator Chris Murphy about the Biden administration's stance on the bloodshed in Palestine and Israel. Do we have tools in our toolkit that can help the U.S. be influential this time? Because we seem to have been in this episode again and again and again. And the question is, do we have more latitude today after the Abraham Accords? Do we have less latitude? You know, what tools do we have? Well, as you know, it's harder for us to influence events in uh, Israel uh, or in the Palestinian territories because of the lack of leadership on both sides that are interested in dialogue. Unfortunately, uh, Netanyahu has been rewarded politically for moving further away from a Palestinian state. Equally, Hamas has been rewarded for um, organizing militant opposition to Israel. So we don't have the kind of brokers that we used to have in the region uh, to get to a peaceful uh, future. So, uh, well, we still have tools, right? We have leverage, important security relationship with Israel, important humanitarian relationship in the Palestinian territories. We don't have the leadership there that we've had in the past. Okay, so that was Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut, whom I caught up with in Congress earlier today. Now let's get to our discussion with Professor Cole. Juan, let me just ask you, you know, we've been uh, discussing this for decades. Are there elements of this particular crisis that seem different to you? The, well, the difference is primarily um, on the American side, in the sense that you have had impassioned speeches of, by mainly Democrats on the left, in Congress, uh, pretty roundly condemning uh, the, the uh, Netanyahu government in Israel uh, for its actions in Gaza, and uh, not accepting uh, the uh, Israeli narrative about these things, which is that this is merely a matter of necessary self-defense. Uh, the, the issues are being reframed almost like Black Lives Matter in terms of Palestinian human rights. Uh, there is a change also in uh, uh, the uh, Middle East in that uh, we have, uh, for the first time in a long time, seen solidarity uh, across uh, the Green Line uh, so that Palestinians uh, are striking today, uh, not only in the West Bank and Gaza, but uh, in Israel proper, where 20 percent of the population is of Palestinian heritage. Uh, so there's a, a, there's a cross-border solidarity in the Middle East. Uh, there is uh, some solidarity with Palestinian rights. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean a lack of sympathy uh, for Israeli uh, wounded uh, in, in Congress. And this is not something we saw uh, in 2014, 2012, uh, uh, or, or earlier. You know, I think a lot of people are looking at, you know, what were the sparks of this? Was it the grenades in the Al-Aqsa mosques? Was it the, you know, you know, the, the residents in East Jerusalem that had been, uh, uh, were being removed and now is under Supreme Court review? And when they kind of look, is it, is it Mahmoud Abbas not uh, postponing uh, presidential elections yet again? But when you look at that origin and you sort of look at Joe Biden, and I have to say there's no love lost between Bibi Netanyahu and Joe Biden. 
What is your, how would you grade the Biden administration's response so far? Because it seemed to me that he really said, you know, it was eight days before he called for a ceasefire, and I'm not really sure yet what the U.S. position is. Well, there, there isn't any daylight between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government on the, the uh, issue of Gaza. Uh, the Israelis are taking advantage of the heightened tensions and the firing of uh, those little rockets from uh, Gaza uh, to degrade uh, Hamas' uh, military capabilities uh, and uh, to do so without regard uh, to civilian uh, life and property. Uh, and, and probably, although this is difficult to know for sure, uh, some of uh, the Israeli actions in Gaza are intended just to make the Gaza Strip even more uninhabitable, uh, to encourage uh, immigration uh, from it. Uh, but in, in any case, the, the Biden administration has blocked uh, UN Security Council uh, attempts to call for a ceasefire. Uh, and has given uh, every support to Israel and announced $725 billion in, 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 or $1 in, uh, in further military aid right in the middle of all this. Uh, there isn't any daylight between Washington and, and uh, the, the Israeli government on this issue. Juan, I want to play a clip for you of an exchange uh, with Ned Price, the spokesman of the State Department. Let's listen. I want to ask you about East Jerusalem, but let's talk about what you said about the principle of self-defense. Does that in any way apply to the Palestinians? Do they have a right to self-defense? Do Palestinians have a right to self-defense? Uh, I'm in broadly speaking, Saeed, uh, we believe in the concept of self-defense. We believe it okay. applies uh, to any state. I All don't right. think okay. that, I certainly wouldn't I, want uh, my words to be construed no, as- I understand. Uh, I, I want to ask you, I'm, I don't want to harp on this either, but. You know, the Israelis killed 13 people just now, you know, including maybe five or six children. Do you condemn that? Do you condemn the killing of children? Said, uh, uh, I, I, I'm asking, do you condemn the killing of Palestinian children? Obviously, uh, and these reports are just emerging, uh, and I understand, I was just speaking to the team, I understand we don't have independent confirmation of facts on the ground yet, so I'm very hesitant uh, to get into reports that are just emerging. You know, I think many people understand the notion of self-defense, and they understand that there's, you know, there are issues on all sides of this. But when it gets to the horrific pictures that we have seen of the death of women, of young children, uh, you know, scores uh, of them, maybe more than a hundred, as we as we said earlier in the show, um, why is it so difficult for our officials to basically say that's a red line? Oh, because uh, the doctrine of uh, force in self-defense uh, pertains to states, uh, according to the United Nations Charter, uh, and the Palestinians don't have a state. I think the self-defense issue is a red herring in any case. The issue is rights. The Palestinians have no rights. They're stateless. Uh, when you don't have a state, uh, the, you have no courts, you have no, uh, you have no structures that guarantee your rights. Palestinians don't know if they own anything. Israelis can show up and take away their home. Uh, and, and the only recourse Palestinians have at the moment is, is, is Israeli courts, sometimes Israeli military courts, uh, which are uh, on the whole and by and large going to favor uh, Israeli claims. Uh, and so they don't know if they actually own their own homes. Uh, they don't know what rights they have. And in, in Gaza at the moment, they don't have a right to have a bookshop. It may be blown up at any moment. Uh, and uh, so th this is the, the actual issue here is rights. And uh, it's not a matter of self-defense. The Palestinians can't defend themselves. Uh, they're stateless. Uh, they don't have the means to defend themselves. Uh, the, the, the world community is always talking about Hamas as a terrorist organization, and Hamas engages in terrorism occasionally. Uh, but the fact is that there are a few tens of thousands of irregular uh, militiamen who, if they actually went out to fight the Israeli army, would all be killed in an afternoon. Uh, Hamas has been firing those little rockets at Israel. Most of them land in the desert. A third of them have landed inside Gaza. Some of them have injured Palestinians. Uh, they're not an actual military force. And they've killed uh, so far, since hostilities began over a week ago, uh, very tragically, because all life is precious, but they've killed 
uh, less people than in some um, mass shooting attacks in the United States by one individual. Uh, so th this is not a, a military confrontation. They're not, we're not talking about self-defense here. We're, we're, we're talking about occupation. We're talking about denial of rights. Many years ago, uh, Professor Cole, we were together at a conference, and the late, uh, now late, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski spoke there uh, about a crisis sort of like this. And he said, look, this is like uh, 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 killing hostages. The, you know, these people are in the care. They're occupied by Israel, and this is like killing hostages. And, and, and the, I'm quoting Brzezinski. This, these are his views. But when you kind of look at that legacy of time, at that moment, Palestine always came, came up as a strategic fault line between the West and the Arab world. It was, it was filled with that much consequence. With the Abraham Accords, now with so many Arab states having normalized with Israel, one wonders if there's any strategic relevance uh, in, in Palestine anymore and whether it's just a moral uh, uh, play at this point. What are your views of that? Because I, I, I remember you being in the room when Brzezinski said that. But that was a moment when when Palestine and its fate seem to matter more than it does strategically to the various stakeholders in the region today? I would argue that the Palestinians have never been strategically important, and that's mm. why they're in the position that they are. Uh, it's never been uh, Im important to anyone uh, to settle this issue and make sure that they don't remain stateless. There have been lots of stateless people, uh, but uh, their statelessness has been resolved by the international community because it's been recognized as a kind of atrocity. Mm. Uh, the, the, the Taiwanese in, in Japan in 1971, when when uh, Japan recognized one China, uh, were left without uh, uh, you know a diplomatic recognition for a while. But eventually, the Japanese solved that problem in one way or another. Uh, but the Palestinians, uh, there are five million of them who have been left stateless uh, inside. Uh, the area controlled by Israel, plus the stateless Palestinians in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, and uh, even the Palestinians in Jordan who, who were given citizenship, uh, their citizenship is second-class citizenship and often fragile, and, and 40,000 of them had it taken away from them not so long ago. So uh, that's the big issue, is that these people are stateless, and there, there's no since 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 Egypt made peace with Israel, uh, which was a separate peace uh, uh, in in uh, the late 1970s, uh. Uh, there's been no strategic uh, player any place that had an interest in protecting the Palestinians. Juan Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, has said that the that the real instigator of this was President Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine, who yet again. Uh, postponed elections. He's been in uh, uh, office, uh, you know, something like 11, 12 years past. He's going to his 12th years past his fourth four-year term. Uh, and that this created um, the dynamic where Hamas wanted to demonstrate its muscle and strength uh, and, and legitimacy uh, to Palestinians. What, what complicity does Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority have for the conditions we see now? Well, Mahmoud Abbas is irrelevant, and uh, the, you know the the Palestine Authority was supposed to to have all of Palestine by the uh, uh, late 90s, uh, and Bibi Netanyahu himself uh, destroyed that prospect of the Oslo Peace Accords and and left the Palestine Authority with only 40 percent of the West Bank, and even there they're they're under the thumb of the Israeli military occupation. Uh, they can't do anything that Israel doesn't want them to do. And, yeah. and they're basically policing these people for Israel. So uh, Mahmoud, uh, uh, I mean, Richard Haas is just wrong. This has yeah. nothing to do with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. It's the situation on the ground. P people in the United States don't, don't actually follow uh, events in the West Bank and Gaza. And they're almost never on the news uh, unless there's some big blow up like this. Uh, but if you read uh, the, the Palestinian and Israeli newspapers about what's been going on in every little town in, and village in the West Bank, uh, then you see brutalization, you co see colonization, you see these militant squatter settlers from Israel on Palestinian land that they stole from Palestinian families. 
uh, burning down uh, their olive uh, trees, cutting them down, uh, invading their property, uh, building on it, uh, taking over their homes. And this is a daily uh, staccato uh, performance uh, of occupation. And in Gaza, uh, you know, the, the, the Israelis bombed the air airport uh, 20 years ago, and uh, there's no harbor. The, uh, uh, the Gaza depends heavily on protein, fish for protein. They're not allowed to fish beyond uh, uh, three, three to six uh, miles uh, uh, by the Israeli Navy. Uh, the, the Israelis, uh, uh, you know, carefully monitor what material, including building material, goes into the Gaza Strip. Uh, so these people are are living in hell, uh, and uh, any it, it's it's a, a tinder that can explode at any time, and and so looking for a particular trigger for it is a fool's errand. It's mm. not a Mahmoud Abbas. I mean, the particular uh, event of the invasion by the Israeli government, outrageously, of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, the attack on worshippers, the throwing of flash bombs, the setting of fire to, to rugs, uh, during uh, uh, a, a holy period of the fasting month of Ramadan, sure, that, that set off a lot of problems, but it, it, it's not one incident. It's 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 everyday life that's creating these uh, these these constant tensions and, and flare ups. And as long as the occupation goes on like this, and as long as Israel is actively colonizing uh, Palestinian uh, land, uh, then there's going to be trouble. Juan, in my discussion with not only Senator Chris Murphy, but just casual conversations with other senators I had uh, up today. I heard from them that what has hit their radar screen, what they feel is different that they have noticed about this conflict versus the many other times we've been, you know, around uh, uh, this circle, is that Arab Israelis are rising in protest, that there is violence inside uh, between uh, uh, Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis inside Israel. This is a new feature. Is this a key element of how this unfolds? How, how does this fit into the puzzle? Right. So the, uh, uh, I called them Palestinian Israelis on the model of Italian Americans. Mm. Uh, the Palestinian Israelis uh, had been relatively uh, quiescent. They're heavily policed, uh, and 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 until 1966, they were actually under internal military rule uh, inside Israel. Uh, but uh, they, uh, um, uh, you know, a lot of. Palestinians in Israel live in uh, villages that are not officially recognized by the Israeli government as existing, and they don't have permission uh, to, you know, if, if a wall falls down, to repair it or, or to fix their, their, their toilets. And uh, um, the, uh, the Likud party has actually gone in and, and recognized some of these villages and given them, them these permissions to have a decent life. Uh, in return for which some of the Palestinian Israelis have voted Likud, uh, even though it campaigns on them being terrorists and uh, threats to the state and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, th there had been mechanisms inside Israel whereby uh, the, uh, the Palestinian Israelis were, were kept quiescent. Uh, they are the least educated uh, and the least well-off uh, part of the Israeli population. Uh, I, th I think their frustrations uh, have to do with, in part, uh, with their attempts to uh, become more part of the Israeli fabric. Uh, their their joint list uh, uh, in the uh, there's been so many recent elections, but uh, last summer uh, they managed to get 13 members of a parliament of 120, uh, and they should have been a, a swing vote, uh, and and all the other. Parties, which are Jewish-based parties, refused to deal with them, refused to have them in the cabinet, refused to uh, uh, to have any talks with them, and, and they were sidelined. Uh, so it would be as though you know the the African American uh, caucus in in the House of Representatives uh, were, were poisoned to all the other politicians in Congress, and you could never have an African American in the uh, in the cabinet, mm -hmm. and and so forth. So I, I think. That these uh, the, the relative electoral success of the joint list 
and then at sidelining and in and, and the recent election they, they didn't bother to come out and vote very much uh, all of this has added to the frustrations there are local problems that um, I said they're heavily policed with regard to security uh. But actually, uh, there's a lot of crime in the Palestinian-Israeli areas that the, 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 the Israeli police don't bother to follow up on. And there have been protests about a uh, lack of, of state-provided security in their right. regions. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of tensions here. And then I think the Aqsa Mosque invasion mm -hmm. really set them off because the majority of them are on the same. Um Juan, it, I remember back in 2006 uh, instigating an enormous uproar against himself. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, said that Israel was becoming an apartheid state. We're now many years past that point. And I guess the question is, what are your views on, on, on that framing? And is there any solvency anymore to a two-state solution, which, which is hardly discussed anymore? It occasionally comes up. It's sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the religious... Uh, 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 you know, incantation that the two-state solution must exist. But what are your thoughts on, on the choices that face Israel and Palestine now? Well, there is no uh, plausible two-state solution any longer. If you look at a map of, of where the squatter settlements are from Israel over into Palestinian territory, uh, it, it's, it's become Swiss cheese. The Palestinians mm. have divided up into cantons. They're, they can't even get to one another without uh, going through Israeli checkpoints. There are roads for Israelis only. Uh, so there's not going to be two states. Uh, and and uh, by the time Jimmy Carter talked about apartheid in uh, Israel-Palestine, it had already been a reality for, for decades. Uh, and, and that's just going to go on. Uh, I should underline that apartheid has become a term of art in international law. Uh, some people say, well, the situation isn't exactly like in apartheid South Africa. Mm. Uh, but actually, uh, South Africans often say that from their point of view, what's going on seems to them worse than what they experienced in apartheid South Africa. But the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court uh, defined apartheid as a systematic denial of rights to one ethnic group by another. And that's certainly what's going on in Israel-Palestine. The Palestinians are being denied rights that, that Jews have. Uh, they're uh, uh, on the order of, of, of 14 million people between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, all of them under Israeli rule in one way or another. Uh, and, and Jews are, are privileged mm. and Palestinians are disprivileged. If you were sitting down with President Biden or other stakeholders who may matter more than President Biden, what would be the bank shot that might get us into a different course uh, than we're in today um, in this in this tragedy that's unfolding every day as we watch? You know, the the, uh, the Palestine uh, Israel situation is so heartbreaking and most people just turn away from it. And there's always this hope that there is some magic bullet. There's some solution. There's some set of negotiations that would resolve it. There aren't. This is, a, this is as hopeless a diplomatic situation as you could possibly imagine. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is beyond diplomacy now. This is apartheid, and it will just go on like this. You and I w w will be ancient and sitting on our rocking chairs and near death, and, and we'll still be talking about it. There is no prospect of this getting better anytime soon. Well, it's one of the few times I, 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 I fear you're right. I wish you were wrong. Uh, thank you for your sobering comments. Juan Cole, University of Michigan professor of history and founder of the Informed Comment blog on U.S. foreign policy. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much, Steve. So great to see you. So what's the bottom line? The murder of George Floyd sparked a national conversation in America that centers on white supremacy and the racist legacy of colonialism. So naturally, the debate on Palestine and Israel has shifted slightly in the United States, especially among the younger generation and within the Democratic Party. Notice how New York City candidate for mayor Andrew Yang had to immediately acknowledge that Palestinians actually exist after he took a one-sided position on the conflict last week. And notice that some American media and human rights groups are calling out Israel for being an apartheid state now. But that doesn't change the harsh reality of U.S. policy toward the region. Israeli interests still reign supreme in Washington. And Israel is the regional superpower and it's closely aligned with the United States. Now that Israel has normalized relations with the UAE, with Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco, plus Jordan and Egypt, who were already there, you can see that the fault lines in the region have dramatically changed. The Israeli government thinks there's little cost to doing what it's doing right now. 
And in less than two years, the Republicans, who are unapologetic supporters of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, may just win back control of Congress from the Democrats. All he has to do is wait. So even if it's true that support for Israel and the Democratic Party may be shifting ever so slightly, it's not likely that America is going to save the day. And that's the bottom line.